Okay, good morning everyone. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Morgan Micheletti from Houston, Texas with us. He will, uh, he will talk about a technique he developed to rescue subluxated uh, single piece intraocular lenses uh, 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 called punch and rescue. Dr. Micheletti, thank you again and please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for inviting me to talk about this new technique and just about the innovation in our, the continued innovation in our field. Uh, it's an honor to be, to be here today chatting with you. So this, this technique is called punch and rescue, but uh, I'll talk about a few other techniques and kind of what's available now in terms of refixating dislocated IOLs. So here's my financial disclosures, uh, none of which are relevant to this talk. I actually, any proceeds I get from the IOL punch from a patent standpoint, I actually donate to the hospital that I trained at. So residents, remember, give back to the hospital you trained at so they can continue to train the next generation of surgeons. Okay, so IOL dislocations. Now, a lot of this applies to just the United States because that was the kind of population that I was looking at. Uh, but, but there's a broad range of incidents in terms of how much this happens. So data or, or current publications show anywhere from 0.05 to 1.8%. I think that's a little high in terms of the rate of dislocated IOLs. I think it probably is close to that 0.05% or perhaps even lower. Uh, but in the United States, we have about 4 million annual cataract surgeries. So around 2,000 to 10,000 IOL dislocations just in the United States alone. So there was this need for this because we know that more and more patients are getting multifocal or toric IOLs. And in the United States, at least, they had to pay good money for that out of pocket. And they're not looking, they're not looking to just lose that, lose that ability to have their astigmatism corrected or have a multifocal IOL be able to see distance intermediate and near. Now, a lot of these cases that I'm showing here, these are just some, um, these are both actually dead bag cases, uh, which was recently described, uh, a recently described entity, but you can see some dislocated IOLs here. It's a ZC or a Technus platform on the left, and then the Alcon uh, Acrosoft platform on the right. And moving forward, we got a few others here, just some more uh, dislocated IOLs. The one on the right here is actually one of the first ones that I that I utilized the punch and rescue technique on. So <clears throat> in this image, I, I just wanted to show this. This was the first ever dislocated IOL I ever saw uh, at a patient when I was in training and residency that presented after a Coke bottle. His son threw a can of soda at him from across the room and this hit him in the eye and dislocated his entire IOL. So that was the first one I saw. That's just more on there for historical sake. But what are the current options? The standard of care for the most part is explantation and then a typically a Yamani technique with a three-piece IOL. It, we typically use the Zeiss CT Lucia, uh, but there's a, a couple other three-piece IOLs that could be implanted. But again, it's a monofocal IOL. There are some people explaining IOLs and then doing a Yamani technique with the, with the light adjustable lens, which is a very interesting option. And, and for low orders of astigmatism could be a good option for certain patients. Uh, there's also the belt loop suture, which was developed by Kathy McCabe, utilizing Sergio Canabrava's uh, double flange technique, which I'll go into more in a little bit. Uh, and then you can always try to pierce the IOL with a with a needle or suture. And I'll, I'll talk about that and also why that's not a good idea. Uh, but the bell loop suture is a great option. It's a great way to try to salvage the lenses. Uh, and then obviously explanting is an option, but it's not, it's not a great option. We know that IOL exchanges have limitations and can, can reduce epithelial cell count, can lead to inflammation. Uh, and so we wanna try to minimize explanting an IOL if we can. And the bell loop suture is a great loop option as well, but could potentially have some limitations. Although I like to, I think that the bell loop and punch and rescue play very nicely together and can actually be used in conjunction. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. So here's, here's a bell loop and I'll, I'll kind of fast forward through some of this. This is Dr. McCabe's video uh, showing how she utilizes her, her um, she's utilizing the double flange technique in order to refixate the dislocated IOL. 
So she goes in about two millimeters posterior to the limbus, and she's just going to go in right at the elbow of the haptic optic junction and thread a 60 proline through, uh, through that 30 gauge TSK needle here. And I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit. So she's thrown one and now she's thrown the other one and, and essentially she's creating a belt loop. So it's just a C around there, but it's two scleral passes. Uh, so, and that has to be done on each side typically. So, you know, the movements are very similar to punch and rescue and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, advantages of this technique is that it can be all done through small incisions. Typically this just requires a couple of paracentesis, a couple of paracentesis or one millimeter incisions into the AC. And then you can do the rest just through a 30 gauge needle with a 30 gauge needle and docking that 6.0 proline through. So great technique, uh, really need the bag to be pretty scarred down. The IOL has to be in the bag for the most part. Those haptics are so gummy that if it's not, the belt loop can easily slip off. That elbow of the haptic can just open right up and then you're back in, in the position where you were. So that's that's the belt loop. And I'll, again, I'll, just, I'll just kind of fast forward here, using that cotter to create that flange there and then tucking those flanges into the sclera. So very similar, a lot of the double flange techniques on, on the videos that you see myself or Dr. McCabe or Dr. Ken Ravid uh, perform, all kind of utilize this cautery, uh, creating a flange and then tucking it into the sclera. So the limitation with the current options, I have seen people puncture an IOL with a hypodermic needle or with the suture needle, and I'll go into why that's not a good idea here in just a second. You just saw the belt loop and the lasso. Limitations potentially are that it could slip uh, off of the haptic that the haptic could open up or that it just may not be as accurate a fixation for a, for a um, toric or multifocal IOL. It can absolutely be done and it's a great option, but sometimes it can be a little challenging and it's two scleral passes, therefore two flanges uh, instead of one. So potentially a little more increased risk of erosion with a flange just because you have twice as many. And then explantation is an option as well, but we talked about that. Uh, for those of you who have seen or have done or have your attendings that do a lot of IOL exchanges, sometimes we have patients whose corneas just don't like it. It could be perfect IOL exchange, and then they have limbus to limbus corneal edema, and they're in line for a DSEC or DMAC. So again, we want to try to limit uh, explantation. So needles don't remove any material. So if you take a needle and poke it through the haptic optic junction, you're actually not removing any material. You're leaving this tiny slit behind. And the problem with that is just like when you go to make your capsular rexus, you want to make sure you have something nice and round, something that's not going to run out when you put suture through it. And you can imagine here that if this was just the needle you went through, if you put suture through that, that could easily tear out. And same thing with, now this is a, this is a very large example. You wouldn't use a needle this large, but I wanted to really highlight same sort of thing. If you take a suture needle and thread it through, you're leaving behind kind of all these tags. Uh, and it's, it's very similar to if you, uh, I, I did this all the time uh, when I was growing up, maybe that makes me old now, but you know, we had three ring binders and a lot of times we didn't always want to actually take the time to go use the hole punch so we just take our paper and slap it on the rings and each piece of paper would look like this. And that's really almost what the IOL looks like uh, when you take a suture needle or a hypodermic needle and poke through it. The, the problem is you're not removing any material. And so you can actually induce slight aberrations in the IOL emanating from where the needle pierced the IOL. Because, the, because there's no uh, removal of materials, it has to accommodate for that new material. And so you can get these uh, ripple effect kind of going through the IOL. So my idea was to <laughs> go ahead and use that hole punch to create a nice, a nice hole. So here's the punch. Uh, and this will be available, I, I believe, relatively soon uh, from, from Diamatrix is the company I worked with to develop this. And you can see it creates, in this image, it's creating a nice hole. And on the contralateral side, it's actually capturing the piece in the basket. Now that happens uh, outside the eye, it doesn't always happen in the eye. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. So this is a high mag, high resolution image of the hole created in the IOL. 
And it's this beautiful round hole that you can easily thread a suture through up to a 5.0 proline, uh, although I've, I've been using a 6.0 proline nowadays. So this is the piece that's actually removed. And what's cool about it is it's got this kind of curved shape here, as well as the round shape. So when you thread something through it, again, that curved shape just helps to balance and buttress uh, anything you thread through it. And that's really just, that was an incidental thing. That's not something we designed. That's just the way that it happened. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, you take what you get and be very happy about it. Okay, so how does, what does it look like when you actually thread the needle, uh, when you thread the suture through the, the hole created by the punch? So it kind of looks like this. So we're looking about two millimeters posterior to the limbus, and we're going to thread that proline suture through the IOL. So it's just one flange on the sclera and one flange in the, at the haptic optic junction. And there are other options beside that as well. So this is one of the first cases I did, just kind of a proof of concept. And this is just a Model Y simuli, and that's the Iowa punch. And this was one of the very, very early models. You can see I actually have all these dents in it, and <laughs> this is just really early, but just testing out. And you can see a nice hole created right there. There's the core piece that I'm removing and just kind of placing on that artificial cornea just to show that, it, that it's removed. I'm taking 6-0 proline suture, and I'm going to thread that through with a micro grasper and put that directly into my cannula, 30 gauge cannula placed directly behind the IOL. And once you get it all the way in, and, and this is the key part of any double flange technique or, or Yamani, anything utilizing uh, pulling suture through, you really wanna make sure you thread that needle all the way because there's nothing more frustrating than getting that needle all the way loaded or you think it's all the way loaded and you go to pull it out and there's nothing there and you have to do it all over again. So really make sure that that, that that suture is all the as far advanced into that needle as you can. And then in this case, you'll create a flange on one side, pull it on down and cinch it onto the eye. Well, and then you just tuck the haptic behind the iris. And this, this is, again, this was kind of a later case where I'm using 6.0 proline. Uh, but the early case, the very first case that I ever did was with 5.0 proline. So this was a lady that presented after a bungee cord hit her in the face. She was working out had some, some bands that she was hanging from her door and was stretching when all of a sudden this just came down and, and hit her in the face. And she actually has a, she had a restore multifocal lens and really wanted to keep that lens. So this is kind of a video here of the punch, very simple instrument. And a lot of, you know, it's just, it's very simple. It's a, it's a punch. Uh, it's, it's really a trephinated punch. It's actually got a hole with a cutting surface in order to do that. So here's that dislocated multifocal IOL. Going in with a 2.4 millimeter incision. Uh, we're gonna try to miniaturize this punch for, for future iterations, but for now it does go through a 2.4. And I'm gonna go right at the haptic optic junction to create a hole here. Now, in other videos I'll show and, and in other things you can do, you could actually create it in the fat part of the haptic. It doesn't have to be at the haptic optic junction. And in fact, it could even be in the optic on certain IOL platforms. So this was, this was the first ever case I had done. This was maybe 10, 10 or 11 months ago, actually. Uh, and I'm using 5.0 proline, which again, I've switched to 6.0 proline now, but uh, this was just kind of the first use. And also you'll notice that that was high temp cautery. I prefer low temp cautery, but this was also during a pandemic and we actually had some trouble getting and still have had trouble getting low temp cautery. So uh, anyways, creating that flange there with that cautery. And if you are going to use high temp cautery, just make sure that there's lots of BSS to protect the cornea, protect uh, the conjunctiva. It can be done and it can be done safely. You just have to take a few extra steps. So here's another case. Now, this is a dislocated single piece SN60WF, so the, the yellow tinted Acrosoft lens. And I'm going to try a belt loop here on one side, at least just to start, because this thing was about to fall back. So just kind of quickly throwing a belt loop there. Uh, then I'm going to create a couple incisions for the punch. Now, this patient had had prior RK, so there is eight cut RK that I'm having to navigate here with uh, kind of with the punch in terms of where I can go. So I do create a hole on the haptic. And one way that I like to thread the, thread the suture to get it in that just creates less incisions is actually docking, reverse docking that 30 gauge 
uh, needle and the suture outside of the eye and then inserting it. And so you saw that at the very beginning of that case and then there at the end, it's just a, a nice easy way to get the, get the suture into the eye to begin with. So creating some flanges here, I'm actually going for three point fixation because to create a surface, to create a plane, you need three points. My plan was to originally do uh, one, two, and then a belt loop on this side, but the belt loop slips out. And that's what you can see here, that belt loop slipped out from that haptic. So I'm going in and creating the third punch on that side, all from the same incision, which is something that I hadn't done before is creating all three punches from one incision. So once I have this IOL tethered, I've actually got it, it hooked. It's already been punched and rescued on two other sides. So I know that I can manipulate this IOL. It's not, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to fall back. They, it's got a leash on it. And, and that's really the key here. So this is, this is a, it's, it's a great technique. It does take some time. Uh, I would, I would actually encourage if it's a monofocal IOL, I think going with, um, the belt loop technique is a great way to get comfortable with utilizing the double flanges. If it's a toric or a, um, or a multifocal, I think that that is a great option to use punch and rescue. You can also use punch and rescue in some other cases. And we'll kind of talk about that here too. So let's say, let's say you're doing a Yamani technique. You're almost done. You've got the new lens in, you've got your, you've got your haptic through one side and it's already fixated. So it's already fixated on this side over here, but all of a sudden, as you go to pull through the proximal haptic, it comes off. The, the haptic breaks away, you know, is, is the option. Okay. Well, we just got to start all over. I got to, I got to take this lens out, put a whole new lens in, restart the whole Yamani. No, actually you can use the punch here to create a small hole. And this is just in a model. This is just a proof of concept, but you can create a small hole right at the haptic, uh, right at where the haptic was and essentially replace the haptic with the punch and rescue technique. Uh, and, and that's just, just gonna fast forward here a little bit because I was kind of fumbling around there, but uh, same same idea. Once you take that, that 6.0 proline, suture it through, and now your, your, your money has been rescued and you can actually see the, the haptic of the CTVC up there and then the replace haptic and the flange down there. So just a, a, another unique way, this hasn't been done in an actual human yet, but it is an option for those who have the punch available if you're performing a Yamani technique to have this, uh, to have this available. So, uh, let's see, we already did that one. So this is the paper that I published uh, just, just here recently, really just highlighting that, that first case that's in JCRS. I won't go through it too much because it's available, but uh, here's, here's another case. So here's a dislocated IOL and I'm actually gonna go through the haptic this time, not just through the haptic optic junction, creating that punch in the haptic. What I found in my later cases is that creating in the haptic uh, actually allows for less tilt in the optic itself. So what you saw there was me removing the core piece. Again, using 6.0 proline here, I'm gonna thread that through the needle, uh, through, the, through the hole and into that 30 gauge thin walled cannula that's placed two millimeters to 2.5 millimeters posterior to the limbus. I think what's so great about going through the haptic is that you're really, you're utilizing the flex in the haptic and the haptics themselves can get a little tilt in them without affecting the optic. So I think that for me in the future, I probably will look to go through the haptic as opposed to just the haptic optic junction uh, because it provides for a little more wiggle room in terms of uh, tilt. The other thing you could do is, and this hasn't been done yet, but it's something that I think could be more uh, consistent with the way three-piece IOLs work, is that you could actually turn the punch sideways and create a in-plane horizontal hole through the haptic so that when you tuck in or when you thread the 6.0 proline through that and fix it to the sclera, there's no tilt at all. Instead of having it come perpendicular through the IOL like we do in this case, uh, it actually is in plane with the IOL, very similar to a three-piece. So I think that long-term, that'll be something that, that I work towards 
uh, utilizing is the punch turned sideways. So proximally here, I already did a punch. And then on the distal side, I'm actually going to do a belt loop. And this was really just for access reasons. I, you know, I, I wasn't entirely sure that I would need to, to fixate both sides of the IOL. I was hoping that I could just throw that punch superiorly and get out of there, call it a day. But the inferior portion of the lens, uh, the zonules became weak. And so I decided to fixate that side as well. And, and that's what you see here is, is really just performing that belt loop on the other side. The biggest difference, again, is that it's two different scleral passes compared to one. And you can see just doing that handshake technique. This is obviously sped up. This is at uh, three, three X speed. Uh, really take your time when you're doing any of these docking procedures and then slowly, slowly, slowly pull out that um, suture to refixate it uh, and center it. So here I'm, I'm getting that, I'm doing kind of the final flange, really tucking that in. You'll see me tuck it in to the sclera. I'm actually using the cautery here to cut the suture, which you can do as well. Once you have a flange on one side for the belt loop, you just kind of cinch it down, tuck it in, and that's how you can adjust the tightness here. And once that's nice and buried, uh, I'll go ahead and make sure that there's no vitreous. And I do this on all the cases. You know, a lot of those, a lot of the videos that you may see of Punch and Rescue, and they're all highly edited. They've all had, for the most part, vitrectomies, uh, staining with triamcinolone, looking for any uh, residual vitreous. But what I've been pleasantly surprised with is the vitreous in these cases is actually very minimal. It's very well controlled from the very beginning because you're not disrupting, you're not going in disrupting the anterior hyaloid face like you would if you broke back in cataract surgery and then hydrating the vitreous. A lot of times the vitreous is, it's tampon on it really quickly when you go in with just your OVD at the start of the case. So again, I really filled the eye up here with some prionzinolone, flush it around. And you can see there's, there's no vitreous kind of whatsoever there. Uh, just kind of clean up some from the back. And I think that's, that's pretty much it. So, you know, I always suture these wounds. Uh, that's one disadvantage of the punch compared to the belt loop is you do have to make a 2.4 millimeter incision. So it's kind of a, a balanced thing for me. There's a little more control because I'm actually going through the IOL and tethering that down to the sclera as opposed to just wrapping it around a haptic. Just by wrapping around a haptic, you're making two passes through the sclera, but you don't need the big incision. With the punch technique, you're getting a little more firm grip on the IOL, but you have to make a large 2.4 millimeter incision. So there's, there's pluses and minuses to both. I think that they can be used hand in hand, as I did in that case. Uh, so when could you use the punch in particular in the bag IOL dislocations? That's really what it was created for. Now, you could use out of the bag IOL dislocations. And the reason I say originally, in the bag IOL dislocations is because we want to control where those haptics go. If you're, if you're going to start suturing lenses, you want to make sure that those haptics are not up into the sulcus, hitting the ciliary body or the iris, creating a potential UG syndrome, uveitis, glaucoma hyphema syndrome. So if you are going to do an out of the bag, so let's say you have a, you know, someone, you broke bag or it's a late uh, a late capsular rupture with dead bag syndrome, and you have a lens such as a multifocal or trifocal or extended at the focus lens sitting on the retina out of the bag, you certainly could use punch and rescue, but I would, I would for the most part recommend either going in horizontally through the haptic, uh, through the haptics, so that way you're really tethering the haptics themselves down or truncating the haptics. So actually cutting the haptics off and then performing punch and rescue. And then haptic replacement, I think, is one of those that, that's not often talked about, but it's certainly something that happens is a broken, uh, a broken haptic on the three-piece IOL during the Yamani technique, and to be able to quickly salvage that lens. Again, the whole point of all of these procedures is to minimize IOL explantation and exchanges. That being said, we still have to do them from time to time for, for other things. I, I, I do a lot of IOL exchanges, uh, for, for other reasons. So I'm not saying that you should never do an IOL exchange. There's obviously lots of reasons to do them as well. So uh, special thanks to, to my mentor, Dr. Kaplan, uh, Sergio Canabrava for all his work with the double flange technique. And then Kathy McCabe uh, is one of my mentors as well and all her work with the double flange technique.
So thank you so much. And uh, if, there's, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Dr. Micheletti, thank you for your very, very interesting talk. Okay, uh, it, it, it seems really nice and, and it seems easy, but in your hands. I, 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 have, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is, is there a, a, a steep a learning curve with this technique and, and what are the complications that this, uh, the surgeon who is beginning to perform it may, may face? That, that is an excellent question. So the learning curve is actually pretty low, honestly. I mean, if you're comfortable inside the eye, if you've done or, and performed a fair number of surgeries inside the eye, then I think that you that anyone can do this technique. I had actually never done anything like this. I had never done a belt loop technique. I had never done anything like this whatsoever prior to me trying this for the first time. So, you know, you have to, you just have to know yourself, know what your comfort level is and practice in a model I. I mean, I actually have, well, I don't have them next to me here, but I mean, right next to me is my desktop microscope. Well, I can't grab it, but my point is, I, here's the head of it, but uh, my point is practice these things. Don't, don't go in on the first time just uh, trying something new on a human. Try it out in the wet lab. Try it out on a, on, you know, get a Model Y. They're really cheap online. Uh, and it's, it's a great way to practice. Now, there can be potential, you know, in terms of pitfalls or complications with the surgery. Obviously, the biggest thing that can happen is that the lens drops, right? So it's already floating just on the anterior hyaline face. And then you go in to try to lasso it or to punch it and it just falls back, right? So now if you're working with a retina colleague, that can be, that can be easily fixed because they can go into a vitrectomy and pull it back up. I wouldn't recommend that for, for your average anterior segment surgeon. Um, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go chasing a lens personally if it fell back. I'd leave that for my, for my retina colleagues. Uh, but that, that certainly is one of the potential issues. And then we do know that there, is the, that there can be a late complication with the double flange technique in terms of exposed flanges. So you have to really, really, really make sure that you bury those flanges. And one thing I've even started doing lately is tunneling ever so slightly, almost a millimeter through the sclera before turning into the eye. So that way I have more of a tunnel to tuck that, that um, flange into because the worst thing that can happen is an exposed flange that then leads to endophthalmitis. Thank you, Dr. Micheletti. Uh, I other? think that, yeah, that, that this, this will be a, a very, very uh, interesting option. Uh, you, you said that the, the punch is not available, it's not yet available? It is going through the final stages of packaging. So they're, because they're single use devices, they have to pass all of the uh, regulatory requirements for, steri for sterility and packaging. Um, but it should be, we're, we're hoping it's available by the beginning of May, which would be great. Perfect. Uh, okay, is there any other uh, question from the auditorium? Um, morning. morning. Morning, Dr. Micheletti. Morning. Thank you for your talk, that was great. And yep. congratulations for your work. So I have two questions for you. The first one is, what happens to that core piece? Because you know, I know it's acrylic, but does it does it float around? Does it ever fall off the punch, or where does it go? Great question. So yes, uh, sometimes it's been captured in the backside of the punch. That's if you get lucky. Uh, most okay. of the time, it's just because you've got the lens surrounded by OBD. Many times, it's just sitting right there, and so I just go into the micro grasper and just just grab it and pull it out. And I always I, a lot of my videos I set on the cornea just to show that hey, look, I got the core, but if you were just doing it, you would just grab it and pull it out. And it, it always comes out in one piece and it's, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I haven't ever lost one, but I, I could certainly see that happening. I think that if it were to fall back or, or be lost, as long as it's not in the interior chamber, I mean, if you lost and couldn't find it, you did intraoperative, uh, you know, uh, gonioscopy and couldn't see it in the angle and it wasn't in the sulcus, I think for the most part, it I mean, ideally you get it out of there, but if it's in the posterior segment, it's un it's probably going to be relatively inert. Uh, you just don't want that floating it's around in the you. interior chamber. Yeah, that, that, that was where my, my question was pointed to. And the other question is, I, I see you uh, centering multifocal and toric lenses like properly, but um, 
see when you pull the flange out a little bit, does that decenter the lens? So how do you calculate how much of it you actually pull out? I mean, about this flare flange. Great, great question. Yeah. So as you're as you're doing your final titration, and and again, and the videos are highly edited, so there's a lot of back and forth. So you know, pulling the optic and and the suture oh, okay. one direction, doing a little more, you know, maybe shortening the flange a little bit, and then tucking and then back in, and then going go to the back. other side, and just kind of okay, going okay. back and forth and slowly tightening it until you get it just as centered as you can. Okay. Okay. Because I was looking at the videos and I was like, this guy's amazing. He, he got it the first hit. <laughs> Right. That's right. Yeah. That, that's just, uh, that's just editing skills, not surgical skills. <laughs> cool. Okay. So thank you, doc. Uh, Great talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Micheletti. So yes, yes, I think the bottom line is that we, uh, the surgeon will need to train in the model I has, as you explained before trying uh, to, to do it in, in a patient. Dr. Micheletti, Thank you again. It was a, an amazing talk, and and uh, we will we will be waiting for the the availability of the device, and uh, um, we will ready to try it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. And when it gets to that point, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Happy to help. Thank, thank you, you guys so much. And yeah. have have thank you again, and have a very nice day. Thank you, you too. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.